But I am not a partial preterist, and I have made that abundantly clear in my writing, in my speaking, on radio, on television, and certainly have made it abundantly clear in my books as well. I've clearly indicated that I have a great deal of difficulty with the partial preterist method of interpreting the book of Revelation. So while it is true that I believe that many things have been fulfilled in the past, I also think that many things are going to be fulfilled in the future. So I don't think that the futurist label nor the partial preterist label is particularly helpful. I think it's critical to recognize, however, that the reason I make this distinction has to do with how you read uh, the book of Revelation. It has to do with the art and science of biblical interpretation. As I start my, uh, my remarks this evening, I would like to just take a few moments with all of you who love the Word of God to actually draw our attention back to the Word of God. Because after all, this is the testimony of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw, that is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it because the time is near. John to the seven churches in the province of Asia, Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from among the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father, To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos. I was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the Spirit. And I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet which said, Write what you see on a scroll and send it to the seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking with me, and when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands, someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. And out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all of its brilliance. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he laid his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first. I am the last. I am the living one. I was dead. And behold, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys to death and Hades. Write, therefore, what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars 
are the angels of the seven churches. The seven lampstands are the seven churches. Now, the first thing we see in the testimony of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place, is that these are letters to seven churches in the epicenter of a Caesar cult. From Jupiter Julius, who was the father of the Roman Empire and was voted into the hierarchy of gods as divine Julius by the Roman Senate, to Nero Claudius Caesar Augustus Germanicus, who was worshipped as almighty God, the Caesars would deify themselves as gods. Octavius, the second Roman Caesar, took on the moniker Augustus, meaning worthy of reverence and worship. Upon the death of Tiberius, the Roman Senate awarded the city of Smyrna the privilege of building a temple in which to worship him as Almighty God. Caligula was so convinced of his own divinity that he purposed to have a colossal image of himself erected in the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. For Claudius, the spiritual supremacy of the state was paramount. His philosophy summed up in the phrase, Caesar is Lord. And this pretense was not only common among the Caesars, but also common among the citizens. One need only think back to the jeers of the Jews in Jerusalem when Pilate presented Jesus Christ to them as king of the Jews. In one voice they roar back, Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. Shall I crucify your king? To which they respond, we have no king but Caesar. Indeed, a generation later when Nero succeeds Claudius on the throne, he's worshipped not only as Lord, but as Savior. And it's in this milieu that John admonishes the seven churches to stand firm in the conviction that Christ, not Caesar, is both Savior and Lord. They, as the bride of Christ, will face the tyrant's brandished steel, the lion's gory mane, the fires of a thousand deaths. But in the end, though they suffer persecution for ten days, those who do not worship the beast or his image and do not receive his mark on their foreheads or their hands, will reign with Christ for a thousand years. Whenever we start talking about dating a book, I think it's important to understand the essence of the book. And Revelation is a wedding covenant from first to last, from Alpha to Omega. It starts with these seven letters to a persecuted bride that is going to face the full fury of, of not only the woman who rides the beast, but a Roman beast. And it continues with the noxious vision of a prostituted bride. In graphic Old Testament images, we see the judgment of God written on a seven-sealed scroll announced by seven angels with seven trumpets depicting seven plagues that are about to befall a bride in bed with a beast. And this pattern of sevenfold judgment ought to be familiar to every one of us because we have encountered it in Scripture. There's a pattern. And the pattern of sevenfold judgment, as all of you know, was announced way back in the Old Testament in the book of Leviticus seven times. God is warning his people that they are going to be judged four times over. Or put another way, four times God warns that there is a sevenfold judgment that will befall his people. In like fashion, the imagery of sevenfold judgment against a prostituted bride is unveiled on four occasions 
in the book of Revelation. And of course, Revelation then crescendos with the unveiling of a purified bride who is carried over the threshold of Jordan by a bridegroom who has seven eyes and seven horns into a new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, prepared as a bride, beautifully adorned for her husband. And we hear a loud voice from the throne saying, now the dwelling of God is with men and he will live with them. God himself will be with them and be their God. They will be his people. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death, mourning, crying, or pain. For the old order of things will have passed away. All things have become new. It is crucial for us to know to whom the book was written and the essence of the book itself. It is equally crucial to understand the genre of the book of Revelation because Revelation is not just an apocalypse in the sense of an unveiling. It is an apocalypse in the sense of a linguistic matrix that draws its life-giving water from the wellspring of the Old Testament scriptures. Consider for a moment the tree of life that we encounter in the letter to Ephesus, first encountered in the first book of the Bible, and then re-encountered in the very last pages of Revelation where the angel shows John the river of the water of life as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stands the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The manna that is promised to the church at Pergamum first falls from heaven in Exodus. The Thyatira, Jezebel, who promotes sexual immorality in that church is a mirror image of the Jezebel we have already encountered in Kings and Chronicles. The rebuke to the church at Laodicea, my son, do not reject the discipline of the Lord or loathe his reproof for whom the Lord loves. He reproves even as a father, the son in whom he delights first fell from the lips of Solomon in the book of Proverbs. Or consider for a moment what all of you have been studying. There's probably not a person here that hasn't memorized it. Revelation chapter 6, that epic depiction of the Lamb opening the sixth seal. And suddenly there's an earthquake. And then the sun turns black like sackcloth made out of goat hair. The whole moon turns blood red. The stars fall from the sky as late figs drop from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. And then the sky recedes like a scroll rolling up and every mountain and island is removed from its place. The reason I say every one of you is familiar with these words is you've heard them many times before because you're all biblical students. We've heard them fall from the lips of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the Olivet Discourse, after he has pronounced the temple desolate, he's walking away. And the disciples call his attention to its buildings. Do you see all these things, says Jesus? I tell you the truth, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. And then later on, Jesus is sitting on the Mount of Olives and he's surrounded by his disciples. And they ask, when will this happen? What will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? And Jesus gives them a specific answer. This generation will not pass away until all these things have been fulfilled. Now, this means this. This does not mean that. Unless, of course, you're exercising Clintonian grammar. It all depends on what the meaning of the word is is. Jesus is sitting on the Mount of Olives. He's surrounded by his disciples, and he says immediately, After the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. In other words, Jesus and John are talking about the same thing. And Jesus quite obviously is speaking about the destruction of the temple. Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. 
But even that is not sufficient because all of you no doubt even now are thinking, I've heard those words before, and indeed we have. They emanate from the lips of Isaiah when he's speaking about the destruction of Babylon. And Isaiah says, see, the day of the Lord is coming, a cruel day with wrath and fierce anger to make the land desolate and destroy the sinners within it. The rising sun will be darkened. The moon will not give its light. The stars and their constellations will not show their light. If we read Scripture in light of Scripture we will be able to properly understand the Scriptures. So again, Revelation is not just an apocalypse in the sense of an unveiling, but a linguistic matrix that draws its nourishing sap from the tree of the Old Testament canon. Revelation is not a book of riddles originating from a shallow post-Christian mind It is a book of symbols that are rooted in Scripture. But Revelation is also epistolary, isn't it? It has an introduction and it has a benediction. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace. And then it has the benediction. He who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. One must not suppose that there's any need whatsoever to read strained foreign connotations into straightforward communication in the introduction of Revelation. Soon means soon, and near means near. Now, I'm going to contextualize that for you later on. It'll be part of the debate. But soon means soon. Jesus is not linguistically challenged in the least. I think the primary issue that we're going to be debating this issue is who is our authority? Is our authority Hegesippus? Is our authority Irenaeus? Victorinus? Is it Eusebius, the church historian? One thing that Dr. Hitchcock did not make plain here tonight is that while Eusebius can be lauded as a church historian, he was not a scientist in a white lab coat. He had a reason for late dating the book of Revelation. One must never forget, and I suppose all of you probably know this, One must never then forget that Eusebius did not even believe that the Apostle John wrote the book of Revelation. Indeed, Eusebius believed that the book of Revelation was responsible for the millennial madness that had descended upon the early church and did not believe that the book of Revelation belonged in the canon of Scripture. So hopefully we can all agree that Eusebius was wrong. I have spent a lot of time personally in the book of Revelation. I love that book and certainly believe that it is the inerrant, inspired, authoritative word of God. So my authority is not Victorinus. It's not Irenaeus. It's not any of the church fathers. It is the Word of God. I'm not going to test the Word of God in light of the fathers. I'm going to test the fathers in light of the Word of God. Early on in church history, the fathers that have been lauded here tonight embraced all kinds of doctrines that we find anathema. The perpetual virginity of Mary, baptismal regeneration, the demonization of Jews in the centuries following the death of Christ. Which is to say, if we are biblical Christians, we would never have followed in their train. We would have known the words of Isaiah 
chapter 18. Not just a verse, but an entire chapter devoted to demonstrating that the sins of the Father do not remit to the sons, nor do the sins of the sons remit to the fathers. So we wouldn't have followed the church fathers in demonizing Jews in the 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th centuries, and so on. When we're interpreting the book of Revelation, we want to look at the text. And what does the text tell us? I think that all of us should take the time, if we're involved in this debate, to memorize the text, to meditate on the text, and to mine that text for all it's worth. For example, if you read Revelation chapter 17, it tells the story of seven kings, five who have fallen, one who is, and the other has not yet come. And by the way, the title by which the Bible refers to kings is Caesar. Caesar is the family name of Julius Caesar, which makes Julius Caesar the first Caesar, which of course is conceded by Suetonius, Josephus, Dio Cassius, Sibylline Oracles, etc. Uh, the point is simply to say that the internal evidence tells us that the sixth king that was on the throne, the sixth Roman Caesar. And we can go through the litany of Caesar, starting with Julius Caesar, and Octavius, and Tiberius, and Caligula, and Claudius, and we end up with a Nero Caesar. Not only so, but the book of Revelation tells us explicitly that with wisdom and insight, John's readers are going to be able to identify both the number of the beast and the number of his name. They're going to be able to identify a beast with wisdom and insight. And we are now left, if we take Dr. Hitchcock's view, with the notion that uh, Jesus is befuddling his first century church with riddles that they cannot comprehend. This, by the way, is uh, also true of the letter to Philadelphia. Uh, I'm going to save you from that hour of trial that's going to come upon the whole earth. Uh, we have Dr. LaHaye suggesting uh, that that is a text that is referring uh, to a pre-tribulational pre rapture. And if that's true, Jesus is tricking the church at Philadelphia by telling them, I'm going to save you from a trial when in reality the trial had nothing to do with them whatsoever. It had to do with Dr. LaHaye and his 21st century uh, left-behind audience. I'd like to conclude with the three points already cited by Dr. Hitchcock with respect to giving pause to those who are overly dogmatic about the late dating of the book of Revelation. I hold to the fact that if John were indeed writing in AD 95, he would most certainly have mentioned the most apocalyptic event in Jewish history. Uh, here you have uh, the very center that gave the Jews their theological and sociological identity being destroyed. Dr. Hitchcock himself acknowledges that if this had been written two, three, four, or five years, after the destruction of Jerusalem, it would have been, to use his words, crazy, not to mention it. Well, indeed, it would be crazy. And the suggestion uh, that, that Revelation doesn't deal with history must surely stretch all of our credulity beyond the breaking point. All you have to do is open the book of Revelation and read it. It is a recapitulation of Old Testament history from the fall in Eden to Elijah shutting up the sky for three and a half years, to judgment on Babylon, to the tree of life that I mentioned previously, to suggest it does not recapitulate the judgments of God in graphic detail is simply to miss the point. And now we have the most apocalyptic event in Jewish history and someone writing after the fact is not going to mention it? Let me quote my friend Josh McDowell, who says, most liberal scholars today are being forced to consider, this is strong language, forced 
to consider earlier dates for the New Testament. Indeed, says Josh, John A.T. Robinson comes to some startling conclusions in his groundbreaking book, Redating the New Testament. His research has led to his conviction that the whole of the New Testament was written before the fall of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. John Ankerberg, who I see sitting right here, has written this. It is becoming an increasingly persuasive argument that all the New Testament books were written before A.D. 70, within a single generation of the death of Christ. Imagine this. Jesus makes an apocalyptic prophecy on which his divinity hinges. And it is fulfilled in graphic detail precisely as he said it would be. And imagine that the New Testament writers do not seize upon that fulfilled prophecy in light of the fact that this was to fulfill, permeates the pages of Scripture. And to say that Gentiles living 800 miles from Jerusalem wouldn't, care, wouldn't have cared about this is, I want to temper my language here, but is uh, surprising, uh, to say the least. Of course they would have cared about it. This is a primary apologetic that we use today to demonstrate the deity of Jesus Christ. This is the way we combat those who now discount the precious word of the Lord Jesus Christ, like Bart Ehrman. And yes, I do think that the temple was intact when John was writing. Uh, He's told to take a measuring rod and to measure the temple of God and the altar and count the worshipers there, but to exclude the outer court, do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles, they will trample on the holy city for 42 months. If Dr. Hitchcock is looking for his ubiquitous three and a half years, he need look no farther. The temple very clearly is intact, and the notion that this is analogous to what was uh, written in Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 40, is simply wrong. Ezekiel was never told to measure a temple because the temple had already been destroyed. A heavenly angel measures the temple very much like what happens in the book of Revelation. Remember the angel who had one of the seven bowls, who had the seven plagues? He takes John up to a mountain and shows him the holy city coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God, and his brilliance was like a very precious jewel, like a jasper clear as crystal. It wasn't John that measured that city. The angel had a measuring rod of gold, and he measured the city, its gates, and its walls. Found that the city walls were 144 cubits thick by man's measurement, which the angel was using, pregnant with meaning, of course. So this idea that there's a parallel between Uh, Revelation chapter 11 and Ezekiel 40 is simply not true. There's a parallel between Ezekiel 40 and Revelation chapter 21. Let me conclude with the words of Norm Geisler, also a preterist, who said, if you and your fellow followers write accounts of Jesus after the city and the temple are destroyed in AD 70, aren't you going to at least mention that unprecedented national, human, economic, and religious tragedy somewhere in your writings, especially since the risen Jesus had predicted it? Of course. And by the way, that's a small snippet out of a number of pages in which he makes a compelling argument for the fact that the late dating doesn't make any sense. Ultimately, the question here tonight is, how are we going to interpret Scripture? Are we going to follow the rallying cry of the Protestant church, sola scriptura? Or are we going to make our decisions based on church fathers 
that embraced all kinds of doctrines that we today as Protestants do not embrace.